So welcome and hi. I hope your day has gone well so far um, and that this also goes well, fingers crossed. Um, so my name is Amanda Middleton and I'm associate at uh, Pink Therapy and I also work at the Pink Practice um, and do a little bit of teaching at, at IFT and at Bedfordshire. And I was asked to talk about queer in the context of the themes today. And there was a few different revisions on the title. And in the end, I think I just agreed with, with being queer. And then after that, when I was looking to, to, to prep the, the conversation that we could have, I thought, oh God, that's terrible. It doesn't even fit with queer theory. So I thought, well, maybe it could be like doing queer. And then, and then I was like, no, that's not quite right. And then I thought, oh, I can be all cool and talk about um, Eve Sedgwick's work and I can, I can do becoming queer. And then I was thinking, oh, that's very complicated. I don't know whether even I can get there today. So I just thought, I'll just do it queer. Um, I discovered queer and embraced it in my 20s. I was lucky enough to fall into um, some critical psychology teaching back when I was a, a tiny young thing. And I, I immediately embraced it and I immediately understood it to explain myself um, better than the L, the G and the B words and the ideas that were fo sort of floating around for me at the time. To this day, I rely on queer as a sort of a great comfort in moments that make little sense uh, in my world of sex and gender and in uh, the sex and gender that I see in the people that I work alongside um, and also my peers and friends. So I spent lots of time worrying about how I was going to explain and how queer would be relevant to the conversation today. Uh, and then I remembered this. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, well, that's that, isn't it? That's finish up there. Um, queer cultures and identities have always marked themselves out as somewhat alternative to gay culture and identities, having a sort of a different substance or a different way of being. But I think it's important to note as well that we need to honour words like gay, lesbian and bisexual because these have an important place in people's lives. And I think that they bring a relative comfort. As much as I embrace a queer identity, I've also relied on some of these other words at other times. There's a peacefulness that can, that can come from assuming a stability in identity and, and a, a knowledge that you might share a politic with other people. There's certainly a loveliness in the ease of communicating who you are to the person at the shop or in the bar or your lover. Queer can feel disruptive to these identities because it brings with it a preference for movement, for disruption and for non-normativity. And I'm going to talk in a little while about what some of the affordances and constraints of a queer identity might be in terms of um, thinking about, about clients. This is a highly technical uh, diagram <laughs> that, that obviously I, I worked long and hard into the night about with, um, which explains how, what I think are the standard ways that we conceptualise um, the clients that we work with in, in the work that we do. I think when most of us are engaging in a labelling practice or trying to think about our clients, we're using one of these three understandings. The first one represents um, a sort of a binary understanding. Our clients are straight or gay, homo or hetero, um, trans or cis, and this kind of two system categorization. The next one down, the yellow boxes, is what I call the sort of the ticker box model of sexuality. Like, if you have to tick a box, which box are you going to tick when you get to that form? And I think that it. Um, it limits our thinking as well because often people describe experiences which have them not quite fitting in the box all of the time. So the third uh, squiggle, you might say, is my visual representation of queer and queer theory. Um, the understanding that sexuality is multiple, context-dependent and ever-moving, but also that it comes with many different threads along the way. So I think when we start to talk about the work that we do with um, supervisors, with colleagues, and even in the language that we bring into the therapy room, it's important to understand which meaning falls out of which language. So LGBT, I think, creates a beautiful linguistic ease. 
But this kind of ticker box model can invite us to, um, I guess, replicate a sort of a normal and other system for understanding um, sexual and, and gender identities. Um, it's a sort of a, a dictonomous logic that's rooted to modernism. I liked what um, Charles was saying this morning about our tendency to categorise. And this, I think, falls out of some hard work in categorising uh, sexuality. Sexual and gender diversity, again, I really like it. I think it creates a, a linguistic um, sort of usefulness and a wide scope for inclusion. But I think it, w it risks drawing our gaze away from some very specific parts of marginality. So we get to queer um, and thinking about what queer means and how it might be useful. So queer uh, has lots of different meanings, as everything does. Um, and one common one that's talked about is that of a, a reclaimed term of abuse. That doesn't always fit for people. Some people didn't have that word known to them as a term of abuse. Some people say that when that word was used as a term of abuse, it was used in a very different way. So it might have referred to campness or femininity rather than being um, sexuality specific. I like to think of it as a positive connotation of strangeness and that that's when I use the word, that's what I'm sometimes reclaiming. It's also used as an umbrella term for LGBTQQI. Um, and then thirdly, it can be used um, from where it was born, which is, which is queer theory. So queer theory is a postmodern theory of sexuality and gender, which says that sexuality is constructed and experienced and understood in culturally and historically specific ways. Sexuality is multiplicious. And if I could just allow you to say that word again in your head, because I think it's so damn sexy. <laughs> multiplicious, um, context dependent and infinitely fluid. So we start to, to get further into um, the squiggles and the, the mess that is um, sexuality and gender through this queer frame. Um, queer theory has been an area of theoretical growth and development which expands our thinking about sexuality and gender, reliant on, on social constructionism. But I think it's not been taken up so much as a therapeutic device, as a device that we might use to conceptualise some of the dilemmas that our clients and our, ourselves experience, um, but also as a healing tool, how it might allow people to reframe their experiences. So there's three key understandings of queer which I think are useful in therapy, which are taken from um, queer theory. So the first one is the kind of the being queer, the first title uh, that was come up with for this presentation, which is that um, if I socially construct myself as queer, then I am queer. I can stand here and say, I'm a queer person, and that relies on a certain set of understandings and meanings to interpret that identity. It's unfortunate that many of those meanings come from a very white academic frame, and initially queer theory didn't have as much of the intersectionality in it that it does now. Um, we can also think about doing queer and becoming queer. So we can, in order to understand how sexuality and gender are socially constructed, um, we might ask some questions about uh, sexuality categories like gay, lesbian and bisexual or gender categories like trans, non-binary and genderqueer. In order to understand how these categories are socially constructed, we need to ask the following questions. Whom do these categories serve? Who do these categories include? And who do they exclude? Who has the power to define these categories? And I think importantly, how are these categories policed? How do they change over time? And how do they take up different meanings across different cultural, um, cultural locations? The answers to these questions illuminate Foucault's understanding of power as productive. So we start to see power as a network of relationships rather than an entity where one person wields power over another. 
Who holds power because of their sexuality or their gender is understood to be created by cultural discourses and power relations. And so we start to undo the divide between the powerful and the oppressed and start to see that the experience of being powerful and being oppressed can come down to social inequity, the stories that we carry and how we view ourselves. Um, Queer theory also helps us to undo a whole lot of binary oppositions. So the divide between man, woman, homosexual, heterosexual are seen as culturally produced and create a sort of a false coherence and a stability. This is a common practice in Western thought and it's tied to the idea that we subjugate one binary to its opposing other and thus construct normativity and limit what we see as possible for sexuality and gender um, in our world. Hold with me, there's two more really technical bits of queer theory and then we get to talk about what, where it might be useful. So stay, stay, stay with me if, if that's always an invitation, if you would like to. If we think about doing queer, we think about queer as a verb or a set of actions rather than a noun, an identity. So we free it up from a labeling, a labeling practice. So I am no longer queer, I do queer. Um, this way, it's realized as a set of actions that resist norms while simultaneously protest against the idea of normal behavior. So I'm not going to be normal because if I'm being normal, then I'm supporting the idea that normal is normal and that normally actually exists. So if I do queer, I disrupt this power relationship that exists around constructing normal. Um, it becomes a great way to make uh, sexuality categories unstable and to de-essentialise de them. The interdependency of homosexual and heterosexual um, make no sense anymore as discrete categories. As discrete categories, I could talk about that for ages, but I'm I'm going to pull myself back. If we think about queer as a becoming, we think about it as a substantive mode of being. Um, we, we, we think of it as a becoming rather than a substantive mode of being or an identity, which means that queer equals the way that I consistently break habits or challenge the limits and norms and constraints of sexuality, doing away with any stability and subjectivity via a constant reworking of the self in the space between language and meaning. So queer becoming privileges a process. We are always in process. We are not anything at any one time. And it privileges the process of skewed relating to norms, doing things differently um, rather than saying we are something. Now amongst all of this, which again I can sort of talk about for days and confuse myself with, is, is the, the beautifulness of queer is its resistance to be pinned down. So as soon as you think you've understood what becoming queer is, someone writes another paper or something happens in your world mm -hmm. and it completely changes. And I think that's the beauty of queer is its resistance to a singular stable definition and um, its ability to embrace a sort of a diverse chaos uh, when it comes to thinking about sexuality and gender. What's most important is that it's, it repeatedly tells us that sexuality and gender are not internal to us, nor are they individual. Because if we believe these things, then we become blind to the politics of, of oppression, which, are, which make up sexuality and gender um, in our society. Make sense? Yeah. Back to this. <laughs> so uh, this is where I take <laughs> comfort um, in terms of in terms of moving away from theory. What might be some of the affordances of a queer identity? Why might it be useful to me, to clients, to, to anyone really? Coming from the point of view that gender is not a duality, that it, it exists beyond male, female, boy, girl, man, woman, and nor is it fixed in, in space and time, means that changes in uh, your desire for the gender of your partners can be understood as a usual queer occurrence and so is contained and normalised. So 
having frameworks for understanding that you or your partner's experiences of sexuality can change over time is really, really useful. It's especially useful when partnering trans people or when experiencing your own gender identity as something that moves. Queer experiences create different ways for you to experience and also understand microaggressions. So this is one idea that I've got. If we reframe non-normativity as an important and vital part of selfhood and relationships, then this means that microaggressions, those moments when we find ourselves communicated to as less than, as odd, as deficit, can take on a vastly different meaning and become ways that we affirm that we are doing our queerness well. We can take pride in our disruption of non-normativity and, uh, and credit each microaggression as a site of our resistance. This can have very different potentials for how it's taken up in terms of our mental health. What might be some of the constraints of a queer identity? So not having the idea, idea of stability in your sense of self or se sense of sexuality can be unsettling in a world that demands coherence and linear narratives of selfhood. Feeling that you are um, an other within another um, can create feelings of um, not belonging and impact on mental health. It can also interrupt our ability to find communities and to feel comfortable in those communities. And I think discourses and experiences of shame can be more easy to pick up if, you're, if your outsider status is furthermore outsided by a queer identity. In therapy, what do we do? How can we use, how can we use uh, this idea? This is a definition put form forward by um, a therapist called Isenza, who works in the States, um, from an article called What's Queer About Sex Anyway? And Isenza um, gives this lovely uh, definition to say that by using queer, we acknowledge the potential fluidity and multidimensionality of same and other gender and sex experience in all people. So, so she's saying, work from the position that every single one of your clients has the experience of um, a queer identity, uh, the experience of a fluid sexual and gender, gendered self. Um, queer is also useful in therapy because it confounds the nature of sexuality in general and shows us that sexuality uh, is fairly incongruous, paradoxical, uh, and that sex itself is a bit queer. Um, as well as that, it can help us to normalise uh, the awkwardness that comes from working with sexuality. So, uh, I like this definition because it asks us to assume a sort of a universality of queerness. And I'd like to invite you to try it for yourself now. Imagine that one or all of your clients or colleagues or peers or family members, um, that their sexuality is not fixed that it has and will continue to change over time. Imagine that femininity and masculinity are not natural or biologically determined. Assume that each person has more to say about their gender than man or woman, and each person has more to say about who they are attracted to than man or woman. Maybe assume that your clients and other people's genders are primarily made up of ingredients offered by their race, culture or class, rather than the idea of it being made up by something called femininity or masculinity. Now think about it for a second, imagine it. After imagining your clients in this way, what do you want to ask them? What kind of questions does this form of queer curiosity produce? And what further conversations can be had with them about their past and about their future than you've already had? Which ideas about their sexuality and gender do you most want to inquire about? I also think it's important to think about which are the elements of our clients' lives that lack the everyday language to explain. So, so often in practice, we come across everyday lived experience which falls outside of standard discourse. For example, partnering someone through their gender transition. 
being no, being non-monogamous within marriage, the many types of frontier parenting we've seen, BDSM practices, and gender queer identities don't have a lot of language to support them. If we take a queer experience or a queer lens to these, we might find that our conversations become wider. So in terms of doing therapy from a queer lens, I think the first important tool is um, intersectionality, which if I've got time I'll talk about a little bit. The second is to normalise contradiction and paradox. Postmodernism tells us that things can have different meanings all at the same time and that often these meanings are contradictory, which means paradox is part of the experience of being human and that paradox and the way that queer holds on to paradox is actually a really useful tool for understanding how we experience ourselves. We need to assume that sexuality changes across space and time, have co conversations about homonormativity and its meaning in clients' lives, and decenter our professional knowledges about sexuality and gender. It feels like sometimes we come to these conferences and we learn all this stuff and take it back. And we need to find a balance between that and understanding um, the stories that our clients bring. So in my final one and a half minutes, um, I'll give, I wanted to offer a quick sort of, um, some quick tools for thinking about a queer intersectional practice. So the first thing I think in terms of this practice is to extend our reflexivity. I'm systemically trained, so reflexivity is like the little altar that I worship at. But in terms of thinking about sexuality and gender, we need to cast a critical eye over how gender and sexuality are constructed. So what do you consider to be normative behaviours for different groups of people? What truth claims do you make about gender and sexuality? Are we born with it? Are we not? Is it produced over time? Would your sexuality be different if you lived in a culture that had more restrictive rules um, about who you could be with and who you couldn't be with? Um, thinking about which way you conceptualise your own and your client's sexualities. Does it look more like the red line or the yellow boxes or the squiggle when you're sitting and thinking with a client? Secondly, to widen your possibilities and get curious um, about how the meanings that clients make of their lives and the way that meanings are not, the meanings of sexuality and gender are not divorced from other identities. The interwoven loop between sexuality and gender, I think, is becoming more and more interesting to think about. Um, understanding what truth games clients might be using to understand themselves in relation to um, sexuality and gender. Three more slides, but Leah, is that okay? Look at you. I'm, I'm a little bit terrified. Okay, all right, I'll speak really fast. So these, <laughs> these might be some of the questions that we can ask um, in therapy. Which of your identities fit together, if any, and which feel conflictual, if any? How do you manage that? Are there spaces in which you feel all of your identities are appreciated? What makes this possible? How do you, how do you experience it? What skills do you use to move through different contexts where different parts of yourself are recognised or not? What do you foreground and what do you background and what does that mean to you? How do you manage it when different elements have to be foregrounded or backgrounded? Um, in your life? And which parts of yourself feel less visible or more visible, maybe in spaces like therapy or certain relationships that you have? Language, I think, is really important in thinking about queerer understandings of clients. I think singular words often feel inadequate, so clients start <laughs> to create language to explain how they are and where they are in terms of sexuality. And, and we get these sort of reclaimed terms and hybrid terms like girl fag, femme dyke, bi curious, gender queer, words which help to more adequately explain the meaning that people experience in their sexuality. And finally, 
Um, using strength-based approaches along with a queer sensibility, I think undoes a whole lot of damaging cultural narrative around singular discourses. So ideas about core self, authenticity and integration often rub up against um, uh, the queer experience of multiplicity and fluidity in, in sexual and gender identities. So multiplicity, multiple desires, multiple ways of experiencing yourself are often seen as a weakness or a failure in some way in our society. Um, we create this sort of entrenched pathologization of queer lives um, because of the ideal singular. Um, and I think sometimes we do that in therapy. This idea that um, something's a phase is, is based on the idea that we're working towards something singular at some stage, which is not a phase which will be fixed and which we'll be able to sort of rest at for the rest of our lives. And I think that that, that, that undoes a whole lot of things for um, people who experience, experience themselves as multiple and fluid. So I think strength-based approaches with a queer sensibility have the capacity to undo pathology and unravel some of the heteronormative therapeutic practices which might have woven their way into our therapies. So thank you. Thank you.